And every now and then you'll see these cartel videos with these guys carrying around these 50 cows and they show up, they stand there like, yeah, you know, the, the boasting about the rifles. And everybody laughed at them because a 50 cal or anything like that without an optic on it, you know, is like you're going to shoot, you're praying, shoot basically, see if you can hit anything with it. Uh, but now there's a, a few of my sources have, I've seen, you know, sophisticated uh, laser guided uh, range finders and, and sighting systems on some of these that are being found out there. How much damage can fatigue have? What, what was the application? They started getting them specifically with the proliferation of armored vehicles in Mexico. Mexico has a giant industry in armored vehicles as far so, as. So there's a race in terms of uh, armoring, like protecting, especially high value targets and then weapons that can deal with those armored, the, protected, high-value targets. There was a, an attempted assassination of a state prosecutor somewhere in, I think, central Mexico, I forget exactly where, but she was uh, riding around a up-armored uh, Jeep, uh, Cherokee, I think it was, and their main means of, of uh, firepower was 50 cows, and that car was left in pieces. She survived in it, so I think the uh, armored vehicle company that uh, sold her that vehicle has it in the display room. Uh, then before my time, probably two, three years before I was actually active, they tried to kill the uh, head of public security in, in, in the state of Baja. And with him, it was a grenade launcher, 40 millimeter grenade launcher. It uh, it skipped off the ve the armored vehicle and landed in the the, the car behind it, and made the back explode. Uh, one of the guys that I used to work with uh, was actually in that car. He survived it, um, but you started to see oh they're you know using armored vehicles now. So let's get fifty caliber now to try and defeat that armor. Uh, so that yeah, there's 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 always this uh, this race of technology basically down there. Armored vehicles. You know, how do you take on an armored vehicle? Well, there's a few ways. 50 cals, you know, if you can mount them in the right way and shoot at a car like that, or a bunch of kids with balloons and uh, acrylic paint on the front windshield and blind the vehicle so it doesn't, so they can't drive it anymore is another way. Uh, a tow line across a road painted like the painted, painted black so you can't see it and cut the thing in half. Again, I'm not saying any secrets. These are things that people have seen out there. Uh, shoot at the radiator you know uh some of these radiators are not uh even the more sophisticated uh vehicles out there don't have a sufficient uh, armoring around the radiator or the battery housing of some of these vehicles there was a case of a guy i think his nickname was at pelavacas or something like that out in sinaloa level cartel guy he had an armored vehicle he was you know riding around and he got ambushed he shot at his car he was like ah i have armor you can't shoot me and somebody went up to his car and just put the barrel right in the locking mechanism. And that got him, you know. So it's an interesting place as far as people uh, getting certain types of guns. Armor is prolific down there. I mean, everybody down there, all the cartel, cartel members, you see them wearing plate armor. So that's an issue. It's not like you can shoot somebody square in the chest and they'll go down. Are they afraid to kill Americans? So I know I was traveling in Ukraine uh, on the front. So like a lot of the journalists would travel in like armored vehicles. And at first I was like, it seems like this would attract attention. Yeah. Like, it seems like they would want to hit those targets. But then then I realized over time, as I learned, there's a, there's a fear of killing Americans. There could be a drastic escalation of- Yeah, it's not worth it. Conflict. It's, it's picking a it. beehive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's yeah there's there's there is a tendency to shy away or stay away from that you know i mean these they don't want the heat or the attention outside of that everyone's game everyone's game but also there's been many cases of americans being killed down there i mean we saw the mormon massacre uh happen down there and all of them were american mexican they had both nationalities and the blonde kids you know white being uh massacred in the middle of a desert uh, and the car is uh, basically catching fire. This happened, and you know, the America Americans uh, sent the FBI down there to kind of review some of what happened down there. And uh, I think that was when Trump started uh, talking about kind of reviving this whole notion of cartels being labeled as a terrorist organization, probably more for of a political pressure point he was using to try and get Mexico to reinforce its southern border, uh, which it hasn't but there's escalation 
you know, oh, this this already happened and nothing happened, so we can probably get away with it, you know. So and again, there's a newer generation moving forward now of people coming into power. More brutal, more technically savvy. Well, they have the experience of their parents and the people behind them and what they've done and what gotten away with. And now, yeah, more savvy about information warfare. Their main recruiting tool is TikTok. You go to TikTok and you'll see a bunch of these kids uh, at a narco party dancing around. And some of these are videos by cartel members filming other cartel members in cartel controlled territory. And that's a window into that life for who's on TikTok now? Kids. And the enticing aspect of that is the money, the fun, the high roller life. And the possibility of making it to a level, you know? Yeah. A fame of uh, respect, power, money. Here in the U.S., somebody might, you know, I want a mansion. And I want to, like, that, that's their mindset. I want to live, you know, like that rapper. Down there, I mean, if you can buy a a house for your mom, you know, yeah. or, or pay off some debts that she might have or a car. That's enough to kill for. Yeah. So you also, one of the many things you did is uh, you did security, try to protect in this, in this war, try to protect people, high value people. Yeah. How do you do you and others? How is it possible to protect a high value target, like a celebrity or an important politician in this situation? So I was, uh, I was tasked to protect uh, the governor of Baja and his family. Mm -hmm. I was basically replacing a whole contingency of people that were already there that turned out to be corrupted. That wasn't my field, I was operational. I was working with other people doing the counter narcotics stuff and uh, the director of the institution that I was in basically called me and said, hey, uh, you're gonna go and replace this, these people. And I, what happened to them? Well. <laughs> So you were known as a person that could be kind of trusted. I was tasked for that, so I I think they considered that, and yeah. uh, and I I specifically worked for a, a governor named uh, Jose Guadalupe Osuna Millan, uh, who was probably one of the best governors we have had in the state. And people want to see if I'm trustworthy or not. They can ask him directly, and I, I still speak to some members of his family, and we're still you know friends in that way. Is protecting people like technically a difficult? It problem is, to solve. I, for my experience in that time and in, in, in place, uh, he was basically spearheading, you know, counter the, the drug war in Baja when he was in power. So he had threats from all over, not only him, but his family. First thing I realized working that job in Mexico is that uh, we had, we had people coming in to do specialized training of that regard, Israelis, you know, teaching us how they would do things in Israel. That didn't make a lot of sense for us in Mexico, you know. Uh, we had people that had some secret service experience, kind of show us how, showing us how they would do like celebrity uh, bodyguarding or b bodyguarding somebody maybe in California mm -hmm. of that nature. Didn't make sense for us. Then we got to experience some cross training with some uh, NSW, Naval, Naval Special Warfare people who were coming off uh, protection details in Afghanistan mm -hmm. and Iraq. Is there some useful crossover there? we were struggling with the acceptance that we were basically doing protection details in a war zone. So the approach uh, that had to be taken in Mexico was similar to the approach you would take in Afghanistan during a war. Some of the overt militaristic type uh, approaches to security that we had to adopt, you know, from, uh, we didn't uh, move him in a single armored vehicle. We had two of them that looked exactly alike. So when we would move around, we would, switch one car to the other every now and then we would arrive to an event they would open the door and it would be one of us and they were like hey like where's the governor he's in the back yeah. one so they would move to that so we had to do stuff like that and again this is a young me who didn't have any specialized training i was i was on youtube <laughs> learning yeah, learning some of these things uh going online learning about armor vehicles learning about architectural armor i think you just described a large percentage of the Ukrainian military, how they operate, which is on YouTube, trying to figure out how to use some of this technology. And, and uh, that's actually incredibly effective. Yeah. You know, I do quite a lot of stuff where I'm totally not an expert, totally uneducated and so on. It's kind of surprising how quickly you can get caught up. As we we're talking offline, if you take a course, if you talk to an expert, if you learn from an expert, you can like catch up really quickly. For me, it was all of a sudden, I have this uh, director calling me in and I'm, 
wearing vans, you know, and jeans, you know, yeah. t-shirt. And all of a sudden I had 80, 80 some people that I had to move around and I was in charge of uh, securing planes and uh, which I, what do I know about that? Uh, airport hangers, uh, armored vehicle maintenance and, 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 and purchasing and figuring out how to set up a counter assault uh, group for, for a protection detail. And I was like, where am I going to learn all this? Were you able to quickly figure figure some of these things out? On the fly, basically, you know? As I was going, I remember having this experience uh, being in the uh, in our security office on my laptop, figuring out how to set up a counter-surveillance uh, aside to our protection detail. Basically, how to have people looking for people that might be looking for us, you know, type thing. And then going to uh, San Diego, to Coronado, and training with some people from uh, former SEAL guys and uh, NCIS people who did that job in war zones and seeing them critique some of the solutions that we came up with on the fly and being like, oh, I, we never saw that before. Oh, yeah, this is, we're doing it down there. So getting that compliment and also getting their, you know, feedback, like we probably do this or do that. And it, it's it was a learning process on the fly that was pretty... I mean, seat of your pants level. But. Is it possible for the family and for the high value person to um, to have a sense of normalcy, to have no. a normal life? I mean, I tried. I was already starting off on the on the wrong foot, basically, because trust had been violated by the people that I was replacing. So I had to gain that back. Then young kids in that family that wanted to have a you know go out and stuff like that in the most violent city on the planet. So. I had to do my homework and figure out places where they were safe to go to and make friends with certain club uh, owners and figure out ways to put security in some of these places and having to create this bubble of normalcy around some of these people was pretty difficult. And uh, there's no way that that is uh, a normal for anybody. And, you know, God, you know, God bless them. The the I know it didn't. I know it wasn't easy, and I know that it affected their lives, and they they lost on a big part of uh, their youth. Being under that that security supervision and bubble does probably does a lot uh, for for somebody specifically growing up like that. You know, uh, you lose opportunities of things that we take for granted. You know, just going out, just not telling anybody, and going to the store. You know. Mm -hmm because you want to get some snacks or something like that. That's not available to some of these people. I have to be honest, when I was in Ukraine, that was a really big benefit. You'd escape? No, I couldn't hang out. I couldn't eat when I'm stressed. I would fast and not eat much, so I get lost weight. So it's great. <laughs> it's great for the diet. That's a good diet to be in. Basically, be under protective custody. That's a that's a, that's a that's a good idea for a good you know, yeah. new diet. <laughs> and just life. It allowed me to focus, get a lot of reading done, uh, focus on the important things in life. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I joke, of course, but th there's some there's some complexity to this in terms of normalcy of the family, but also just how to operate, like have a mental clarity of, and a lack of fear. Just b basically be good at your job, whatever that job is, if, as a politician, as a leader, uh, even as a soldier. Somebody that I, like, and I think this is Lisa Ola, said this to me, or said something like this to a group of us that there's nothing wrong with being paranoid. It's about educating your paranoia and knowing what to be afraid of. If you're afraid of everything, you know, you're basically overwhelmed. But if you tar start educating yourself as far as specifically what to prioritize as far as what to worry about, you know, war zone, uh, working, protecting somebody, you know, you're not looking at everybody's faces, you're just looking at their hands because that's what's gonna kill you, you know? That's an example of focalizing, you know, what you're paranoid and what you're afraid of. So looking at the hands, that's the specific to a particular situation, but also figuring out which situations to avoid and which yeah. it's okay. I mean, that's like ultimately one of the biggest things you could do. Yeah, route analysis. You know, you you have to get to the airport and you send off two cars to analyze two routes. And then on the fly, you just change trajectory to, to create randomness and unpredictability and have that as a, a security feature. Um, having to, uh, a convoy of uh, four vehicles separate into two convoys and show up different in different parts to, again, make it hard for people to guess where you're gonna be.